OK, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and can I welcome everyone to the 18th meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee? Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones? But uh, some of us do use uh, data, mobile, laptop devices uh, to aid our scrutiny. So that's what we're doing. If anyone else sees us on that, I promise you we're not checking our emails. We have uh, no apologies have been received. And we'll move straight to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. The committee is asked to agree that item six, consideration of evidence is taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Okay, thank you. We'll now move to agenda item two, which is scrutiny of subordinate legislation. The committee will take evidence on the Public Services Reform, Poverty and Equality Commission Scotland Order 2018 and the Public Appointments and Public Bodies etc. Scotland Act 2013, Treatment of Poverty and Inequality Commission and Scottish Commission on Social Security as Specified Authorities Order 2018. So, can I welcome witnesses who are Aileen Campbell, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government. Uh, can I welcome you, Cabinet Secretary, and welcome you to your position. Good to have you here. And you're joined today by two of your uh, officials, Paul Tyler, uh, Tyler rather, my apologies, Head of Social Justice Strategy, and Colin Brown, Solicitor, Scottish Government. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement before we move to questions? Yep, thank you very much, Convener, and also likewise welcome you to your post on uh, this committee. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to seek the committee's approval for the draft uh, SSI relating to the Scottish Commission on Social Security and the new Statutory Poverty and Inequality Commission. And as you said, I'm joined today by Colin Brown from SGLD and Paul Tyrer, Head of Social Justice Strategy Unit. I would like to thank uh, yourself and the members of this committee for their continuing supportive engagement and scrutiny as we work to deliver these important new bodies. Due to the straightforward technical nature of the SSI in relation to public appointments, I will also represent the interests of the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and older people, Ms Somerville, in this matter and speak to both SSIs in this statement. So, Firstly, the SSI, which would allow the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland to regulate the public appointments of both these bodies. Prior to the relevant uh, provisions coming into force, the SSI needs to be approved in order for the Commissioner to be formally involved. As outlined in the accompanying policy note, it would be possible for Scottish Ministers to make unregulated appointments. However, the appointments process needs to be as rigorous and as transparent as possible, and the involvement of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life helps achieve that. As the Committee is aware, these public appointment rounds have now commenced, and I understand that Ms Somerville wrote to the Committee on the 4th of September with information on the Scottish Commission on Social Security appointment round, which is currently open to applicants and closes on the 28th of September tomorrow. The Commissioner's Code ensures that the appointment process is open, transparent and fair, and that all appointments are made based on merit. So I therefore hope that the Committee uh, supports this SSI. Now turning to the order, under the Public Service Reform Scotland Act, this will allow the Poverty and Inequality Commission to consider a wider range of poverty and inequality issues than those that are contained in the Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017. The order is a pragmatic way of delivering a statutory poverty and inequality commission with a wide-ranging remit. It will improve the exercise of public functions in regard to efficiency, effectiveness and economy by allowing a single statutory body to provide a wide range of independent advice on poverty and inequality. That the Commission should have this broad remit is something that Parliament and stakeholders clearly supported during the passage of the Bill. As previously outlined during the bill scrutiny process, without this order, the Commission would only be able to focus on child poverty in line with the remit of the Act. Some members will recall discussing that back in January when this committee considered a draft order prior to further consultation. So, Following further consultation, we have made very limited changes to the draft order. The most substantive, uh, substantive changes uh, make it more explicit that lived experience of poverty or inequality should be among the skills available to the Commission. As my officials advised during the informal evidence session in May, embedding lived experience within the Commission is a key consideration and we will seek to ensure that the Members' Appointment Round actively encourages application from a wide range of individuals right across society. Other changes are stylistic, for example, to change references from section numbers in the bill to those of the Act. 
So, in closing, convener, I hope the committee will support both these SSIs, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you and the rest of the committee may have uh, to assist your consideration. And certainly, look forward also to contacting you in the coming months with details of the preferred candidate for the role of the chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission, and to engage on consideration for the members' appointment rounds. So, thank you, and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Okay. Are there any questions on either of the instruments before us? Uh, Mark Griffin. Thank you, Camilla. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It's a question on the Public Services Reform, the Poverty and Inequality Commission um, order. Um, I think it's welcome that there's that increased emphasis um, that the membership should include um, persons who have experienced poverty or inequality. And when we discussed in private with your officials, we spoke about one of the disqualifying criteria, which was um, someone was disqualified if they had ever been um, made bankrupt or been the subject of a, a trust deed. Now, you can imagine that as someone with lived experience of poverty, mm -hmm. um, perhaps going into um, bankruptcy or a trust deed because of unemployment or mm -hmm. something uh, out with their control that maybe we would want to have on um, this commission. It, and I know there are, there are barriers to, to change that disqualifying criteria, but it was just to ask if there is any work ongoing um, to try and remove that criteria so that we could have someone um, with that experience um, mm. at least being open to joining the Commission. OK, thank you for that. More generally, though, on the point around ensuring that we get um, a variety of voices to contribute to this, you know, there's been a lot of work done to ensure that there's a broad range of ways in which we've uh, attempted to try and ensure people understand that they can um, take part in this commission and, and things are under consideration about how we might make sure that the reach of these of this membership is as wide as it possibly uh, can be. Uh, on the specific around the disqualified criteria, I might ask uh, Paul to, to comment on, on that particular point. Yeah, so the, the Child Poverty Act sets out that um, the insolvency is a, is a bar to membership. But um, what I think we discussed was discussed at the previous session was a debt arrangement scheme, whether um, somebody applying who was part of a debt arrangement scheme um, would be able to apply. And I think we provided advice to the committee that um, our view was that they would be able to, to apply to become a member of the, of the commission. OK, thank you. Pauline McNeil. Uh, good morning, Minister, um, and congratulations on your, your appointment. Um, you might be aware that it was this committee that really pushed for a statutory basis, and I think the committee did the right thing, and I think they should be commended for doing so. But I think also Angela Constance and her officials should also be commended for the way in which they responded um, to that um, at stage two, and this is why we're, we're here. I was particularly interested in the passage of the bill uh, and other members I know have shared a similar view that certain things should be specifically mentioned in the delivery plan. Um, two of those areas would be um, the uh, single parents and people with a disability. Um, I just wondered if you could uh, give us some assurances that you could say today about how the panel members um, that you're about to appoint in time um, will we'll ensure the committee that they'll be able to address the, the, the specific mention in the Act of um, a poverty, anti poverty plan for those with disability and single parents in particular? So I think I would uh, echo the uh, comments that you made around the work that Angela Constance did and the officials did to respond to the clear. Uh, ask and request from the committee around this being having a statutory foot and I think part of that reason to be here today is to make sure that, that co this commission is far broader in its remit than it would have been had it just been not as narrowly focused on, on child poverty and you know again hopefully that will uh, enable us to include the issues you raised around disability and, and single parents uh, as well. Um, so um, I hope that kind of gives a bit of reassurance that this broader, wider remit allows us to make sure that we get as broad a remit within the membership of the, the new Statutory Commission to ensure that we get the range of voices that we need to to ensure that we can tackle effectively or be held to account to tackle effectively um, inequality uh, amongst particular groups in particular uh, and uh, make the, the changes and the, the progress that we need to make on, on the issues of inequality and poverty. Thank you. Okay, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, uh, and, and thank you for for these. I just wonder, just going a wee bit further on the, the previous question in regard to how the interview process will take place. We had a bit of discussion with your predecessor around this, that 
for, for some individuals, the kind of formal interview could be off-putting, intimidating. Not everybody performs to the best in regard to that. And I just wonder what you and your officials have been thinking. Obviously, it closes tomorrow, and then there will be interviews. How will people who perhaps haven't been that, through that process mm -hmm. of a formal interview, will there be changes? Are there any kind of thoughts around that? So that's the one for the, the Social Security, Scottish Commission on Social Security closes tomorrow. And I understand that my um, colleague, Shirley Ann Somerville, sent you the uh, details yep. in the pack for that. And I hope that you managed to uh, spread the word amongst your own uh, contacts as well. So um, and on the basis of the, of the Commission on Inequality, certainly we're given consideration about how we might ensure that we get as wide a range of applicants as we possibly can. So again, you know, any, any thoughts that you might have as a committee around how that might look and what that might look like and what other things might be done to support people who might not ordinarily view this as something that they would want to take part in would, would be welcome. But we are um, having thoughts around making sure that we can have local awareness raising events, maybe ensuring that people can feel supported in their application. There's other ways in which we can probably uh, tackle that, particularly around the Inequality Commission for that lived experience. Um, and again, you are happy to engage with the committee on any thoughts you may have about what might be necessary in order to, to get uh, a broader range of, of voices to apply for the committee. And also, I think there's probably something we need to think about more generally about how we encourage people and that if they don't don't get appointed in the first instance, that that interest isn't lost or isn't lost to the uh, to the, the wider contribution they want to make to Scottish society. Yeah, I, and I think that's very helpful. Um, I suppose where I'm looking beyond is beyond the application mm -hmm. to once you've shortlisted people, how are they treated at an interview stage? That if it's a kind of formal four or five people behind a desk interviewing mm -hmm. for some individuals, that would just be a, a, not a lived experience at all. And, no. and they may not perform or be able to explain oh. that. And it's just yeah. what work can be done in the next few Shh. months around that. Yeah, and we can and take on board your, your points. However, I would point out that this is going to be a very explicit criteria for the application process, that lived experience will be there explicitly and will need to be uh, thought through about how that can be helped and nurtured along, along the way. Um, but I think that's a big step in itself, is having that as an explicit ask and criteria for the members of the of the new commission uh, and it's for us to work out how we as the government and for public and public life more generally help that to be to to happen in reality as opposed to just being words on a on a criteria uh, spec are there any other questions okay there will be no other questions we will now move to agenda item three uh, and normally on agenda item three, there might be a provision for a debate on the motions before. And I feel we've had that exchange in agenda item two. So we're content now to invite <laughs> Ms Campbell to move the motion S5M13766 that the Social Security Committee recommends that the Public Services Reform, Poverty and Equality Commission Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Is the committee content? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, apologies. Do I need to formally move? Formally moved. Yes. <laughs> the voices inside my head heard you move it. But, <laughs> but that's not enough for the official it's report. It's not caught in the official report, the voices so, in so, your head. So, 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 now, so now that you've actually moved it, let, let's do that again. The, the Social Security <laughs> Committee recommends that the Public Service Reform, Poverty and Equality Commission, Scotland Order 2018 draft be approved. Oh, no. Yes. yes. OK. Uh, and can I therefore ask you to move the, uh, the public appointments to the public bodies, etc. Scotland Act 20, 2003, Treatment of Poverty and Equality Commission and Scottish Commission on Social Security as specified authorities, Order 2018. Can I ask you to formally move that? Formally moved. Is the committee content to approve that? Yes. Thank you. I won't get that wrong again, Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. Uh, can I thank yourself, uh, Cabinet thank Secretary, you. your officials for your time here this morning? And can we suspend briefly before we move to agenda item four? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. We'll move on to agenda item four, which is still subordinate legislation. And the committee is invited to consider the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Number Two, Regulations 2018. Uh, uh, could I refer members to the cover note at Paper Two, uh, as it has done before the Delegated Powers and Re Law Reform Committee by division drew these regulations to the Parliament on the grounds that there is a devolution issue. The Scottish Government takes a different view. For future regulations, the DPLR committee has suggested a way to resolve its concerns and has written to the Scottish Government accordingly. Uh, the committee's role is to consider the policy uh, at this stage. Is the committee content to note the instrument? OK, the committee is content to note the instrument. And we will suspend once more briefly. Thank you. OK, we now move to Agenda Item 5, Social Security and In-Work Poverty. Agenda Item 5 continues our inquiry into Social Security and In-Work Poverty and is the second evidence session. The focus this week is on how the design of universal credit impacts on In-Work Poverty. And uh, we're happy today to welcome witnesses who are Rob Gowans, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland, Victoria Todd, Head of LITRG Team, Low Incomes Tax Reform Group, and Kirsty McKechnie, Welfare Rights Worker, Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. So thank you for coming along, uh, all three of you. Let uh, me start an opening question. I know the committee um, is looking very carefully um, at conditionality uh, in relation to uh, working families and how uh, working tax credit has been subsumed by universal credit will or won't impact in relation to that uh, in work poverty. There was a, a randomised control trial where the results were published recently in relation to the lived experience of all, all families in, in, in that group. And there seemed to be a, a disconnect because there seemed to be a report saying that the, the sanction rate for trial participants was 2.4%. But if you actually asked those on universal credit in that situation, they were saying that 20% of them saw a reduction in their in their income. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether you're, you've had a chance to look at that particular uh, randomised control trial, if you've got any comments to make and why that might be the case. Or if you haven't seen that trial, could, could you tell me what your experience has been or what your concerns may or may not be in relation to that in-work conditionality and lower incomes as a result. Mr Gowns? Um, I think in terms of, um, of in-work conditionality, it's something that, um, that we're kind of keeping a, a sort of a watchful eye out for because um, it represents sort of something that's, that's sort of very near in the benefit system in that, um, in that there's potential that um, that in work people would be subject to conditions and potentially sanctions. Um, there hasn't been a huge amount of um, sort of cases of in work people at least that we've advised who who have been been sanctioned. Um, in terms of the the reductions, I'm I'm not. Um, um, I'd need to to sort of go away and, and do a bit more or digging on, on what the what the discrepancy is there. Um, it could be that, that someone's universal credit award is, is sort of reduced for, for other reasons, for instance, uh, to, um, to sort of repay, um, 
repay, um, deductions to repay pay debt or overpayments or, or advance payments, um, or it could be subject to, to kind of uh, the kind of the fluctuations in universal credit because of their because their income. But um, I'd um, to sort of go away and have a have a sort of a good a good look at the um, the report of the study to to sort of see if okay. we can find out what's That's going fine. on. That's fine. Are there any other comments in, in relation to that? Okay, uh, Kirsten McKechnie. Concur with um, Rob. We would need to do a little. There is a lot more information that we might need to see before we could have a, a proper comment on it. Um, I think the one thing that I picked up, I have only read the summary of the study and not the whole thing, um, was that people's experience varied depending on who their work coach was and how much time the work coach had to spend with them. And that's something that we've seen quite evident in relation to anybody's contact with universal credit is that experience very much depends on the work coach and their use of the discretion that they have. And that's something that I think would um, can cause us reason to, to be positive in some senses in relation to in-work conditionality, but it can also cause us concern as well, um, depending on how the work coach uses that conditionality. Okay, Victoria Todd. And I'd also echo we, we're very early in understanding what works um, for, for this group. And obviously, um, you know, the trial was, was helpful, um, but the document notes that there was a number of limitations and that you will need to look at people over a longer um, period of time. And I think also the type of people who are kind of in universal credit um, may not have um, kind of been in long-term work, whereas when we get the tax credit people who are moving across, um, that, you know, they've not had experience of um, dealing with hate HMRC um, in the way they'll have to interact with um, with the job centres. So it's a it's a real challenge as to, to what might work um, in terms of um, those groups. So I think it is early and, and we need to I think um, continue watching, see how things develop, and also you know evaluation and more trials of different methods. I think will be really helpful. I, I mean I'm conscious that uh, even if it is 2.4 percent sanction rate within the trial, but there's that disconnect between the lived experience of 20% feeling their incomes went down during that trial. There's a, that's a significant concern, obviously, but um, also this was under the light touch approach. So if you're conducting a trial under a, a light touch approach, what does it really tell us about the full rollout of universal credit uh, across Scotland? Can it be meaningful from that point of view? Mr Gowns? Um, I mean, I think in terms of, um, I think we'd probably favour the sort of, um, if there is a light touch approach, that continuing for um, for people who are who are in work. Um, there's obviously sort of, um, I'm not sure it's it's going to be in people's people's interest to um, be um, applying sanctions in a in a in a draconian way if somebody is in work there's some of the theory behind um behind sanctions is that it's in some way sort of this sort of holds holds people's feet to the fire to look for look for a job if somebody's already got a job then that's that's not not likely to be to be effective um i'd, I'd echo um um the, the points made around around work coach discretion uh, i think that's that would be sort of important um um, important to apply um, across the, the sort of the universal credit regime because um, people's circumstances are obviously very different. So, um, so I think that it's to try and um, um, estimate, uh, make it a sort of a, a sort of a totally black and white requirement for people in work. Of if you are not earning this amount, then you should you should always look for for work for this amount of time. Is um, isn't going to be effective in in helping people to um, to if they to earn more or to, to get a to get a better job or to increase their hours. Okay, I want to come and I want to come back with other witnesses to, to, to that what, what light touch actually means. So light touch means that for a single person, um, a sanction won't necessarily apply if they're earning over three hundred and thirty eight pounds a, a month. Now my maths might be a little bit out, but that's maybe ten or eleven hours a week at, at minimum wage or something where you can you can avoid a, the risk of conditionality and a sanction. But once this, the, the fully fledged universal credit rolls out, it's going to be notionally 35 hours a week at the minimum wage. So if there's someone out there doing 10, 11 hours a week just now uh, on universal credit, no sanction or conditionality applying, and then there's this work coach sitting there 
and the work coach has to decide when is it reasonable for that person to be on the 35 hours at minimum wage or equivalent. Um, first of all, do you think that's a reasonable condition to have within the universal credit system? And secondly, um, do you think work coaches have got enough knowledge, skills, training and time to use their discretion in a, in a manner that's actually informed to the local work environment and the local needs of the, the clients? So a lot in that. Victoria Todd, do you want to go first? Well, j just coming back on the on the threshold, so um, and, and I can follow up in writing, but my understanding is that um, in terms of this trial, um, that the only people in the trial were those who were earning above the 338 for a single person. Um, because if you were, if you are below that, um, I think it's called the administrative earnings threshold, um, then you would be in the intensive work search groups. If you're above the 338, the, the purpose of the light touch group was to um, see if you could um, take those people more towards um, the 35 hours at minimum wage. Um, that, that was my understanding of, kind of how the trial worked. Can I just come back to you on that then? I, I find a study where you get a sanction rate of 2.4%, because if you actually pick a client group where they're above the threshold for, for, for sanction and 2.4% are still being sanctioned, that would seem a bit odd. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that, that there were sanctions within this trial and those people were above the 338 threat, so they right. were between okay. the 338 and the 35 hours at national minimum wage, and sanctions were part of the, uh, part of the trial. Um, and I think, as Rob said, um, you know, it's a very um, different proposition giving sanctions to the people who are already working and doing some hours than, um, than for those who are maybe out of work. Sounds like we're punishing people for going to work rather than supporting them, but that might just be my comment. How, how I asked about the, the work coach, so you get work coach sitting there, they've got many, many clients, uh, they have to decide what's reasonable in terms of the local jobs market, is there jobs out there, childcare perhaps for families, the effectiveness of the bus routes, they've got to piece all that together, and they've got to say to a client, well, we think you could be doing more hours and earning more money, and you're, you're not doing enough, or they say, we appreciate you are where you are, that's a pretty highly skilled, time-consuming job. Are you confident they have the knowledge to do that kind of thing? I think the, uh, the role of work coaches for, from a literary perspective has, has been something that's concerning us. Um, and if you look at the... Um, I haven't got them to hand the figures from the NAO report as to how many... Um, uh, cases each work coach will have. So in March 18, it was 85 um, people per work coach, and it's expected by 2024 to be 373 um, claimants per work coach. And I think we certainly have concerns as to how you know you would deal with that volume. And I think with this trial, uh, one of the things that was noted is that they had the time and, and the resource to spend with these people. And so what will happen when you've got uh, the migration and, and many more claimants per work coach to consider all of the factors you've just uh, you've just outlined, it's definitely a worry as to whether they can cope with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I move on to Alistair Allen for the next question, do you have anything to add on that, Kirsty McKechnie? Um, yeah, I think just in relation to the concerns about the work coaches, as you've said, that it, people will be expected to, um, to to earn the national minimum, minimum the national minimum wage of 35 hours a week. There will be discretion to vary that according to people's circumstances. But as we've already seen, work coaches, it can be a bit of a lottery as to which work coach you have, as to whether or not that is varied or not. Um, and the discretion can vary considerably from some work coaches insisting that people do do things for 35 hours a week and to some just saying, just check in with me every couple of weeks by phone. Um, in relation to the time that the work coaches have, we already know that that's an issue with their current workload. Um, we have people who are leaving notes in their journal for their work coaches and just not getting a response. Um, and that's before this workload has ramped up. And in terms of the in-work sanctions, um, we have a concern about people's ability to continue to work if they have been sanctioned, because that obviously will impact on their ability to pay their rent, which can threaten their housing um, situation, and also their ability to pay childcare. And if you can't pay for your childcare, you can't go out to work. Um, so I think that's our main concern in relation to that. OK, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Alice Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, well, as the convener has said, there is something instinctively counterintuitive about the idea of, uh, of a system that... Um, that might find somebody for not being a high enough paid job. But uh, I mean, putting that 
initial suspicion to one side. Um, I wonder if you can say something more about the group you described as the intensive work search group and what evidence there is, um, if any, to show that people in that group are, are being motivator, motivated or uh, incentivised into higher paid work through this system, through the, the limited amount of data we have just now. I think, as you say, the, the evidence is limited, um, and we don't we don't have evidence uh, to that effect at the moment. I don't think. Um, I think some of the evidence that we do have is that people are being put off claiming universal credit because of in-work conditionality. People who might receive a small amount of universal credit um, on top of their wages are choosing just not to claim, so that they don't have to engage with the conditionality. But I'm afraid that's as far as our evidence goes. Uh, Rob Gaines, would you like to add? I think we, we would be in a, a sort of similar position as far as our our evidence goes as well. Um, and I think sort of typically um, people will come to a CAB um, for advice on on a benefits issue. Um, I think if they've then um, sort of moved into sort of higher paid work and weren't receiving universal credit anymore, um, they wouldn't necessarily um, come in for advice. So that 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 may be why. Why we're not sort of seeing a seeing a great a great deal of it um, it'd be a um, a note of caution. Um, I think sort of generally as um, as sort of universal credit rolls out further and into particularly to um, people who are currently receiving tax credits, I think it'd be quite interesting to to see the extent to which people will will claim universal credit because um, um, there's um, the to be a, a sort of a, a sort of view amongst um, amongst some tax credit claims, they're not necessarily claiming benefits, and this is something that's that's sort of quite separate, and that um, and that universal credit does bring with it um, bring with it conditions that tax credits tax credits don't don't have. So I think that that's something that will be um, be a sort of an interesting thing to to sort of watch out for as it as it rolls out further. Sorry, I, I, I don't think I can add anything yeah. to what Tom said. Do you want to follow up on that, Alistair? Well, the, just looking here at evidence that's been made available to the committee, uh, studied by uh, Wright, uh, Stewart and Dwyer um, uh, around Social Security in Scotland, um, which concludes that several low-paid workers in that study resented being subjected to in-work conditionality and reacted to that by relinquishing the housing-related and low-wage supplements available through uh, universal credit in order to avoid the necessity of compulsory additional job searches and attempts at the Job Centre Plus. I just wonder if how that squares with your own experience, even if only, only anecdotally, and whether you feel that's a, a fair picture or not, and, and what the consequences might be perhaps for, for vulnerable people who find themselves in that situation. I think it's possibly kind of too early to, to say with, with any certainty because, as Rob said, we've, we've got the tax credit population are still in tax credits by and large and, and we're waiting for those to come across. Obviously, this trial was only um, with, a, with a, a fairly small number of um, people. Um, so I think it's watch and wait to see how um, things might develop and how people might react. But I think you know we would share the concerns that Rob's mentioned, particularly about the tax credit population because you, know, you can make a tax credit claim and then for a whole year have really no interaction with HMRC, which is very different to the regime under universal credit. And that may well put some people off if the amounts are um, small. And, and the other thing I want to ask about related to that was, was around, um, you mentioned the, the experience or the varied experience of, of work, work, work coaching, if you like, face-to-face, uh, -face, some of it only over the phone. And presumably there are... Um, this is going to apply to a lot of large swathes of, of rural Scotland, such as the areas I represent in the islands, where there really is little opportunity for face-to-face, -face and, and people rely almost entirely, presumably, um, in some places on um, telephone contact and so on. Are you able to build up any picture of potential inequalities around the country, depending on what access people have to, to these services? I mean, it's definitely... Uh a challenge. Um, sort of historically, um, there was a sort of a large group of people um, in sort of remote rural areas who would sign on by post, for instance. Um, sort of one of the things that um, uh, that 
sort of DWP have been exploring. It's it's, it's something that they've um, they've sort of discussed with ourselves is um, whether it's possible to, for instance, have people um, kind of remotely attend the job centre via basically via uh, sort of Skype or video conferencing. Um, there's um, and that that might be something from um, from sort of community hubs. It might be from um, for a CAB, for instance, if that's that's the place um, that's that's most convenient for um, local communities. Um, I'm not sure the exact status of that that sort of um, pilot is, but there's it's it's definitely it's 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 a, a challenge in that people um, are not always able to um, to have access a. A job centre that's within um, that's within convenient convenient travelling time. Okay, Alison Johnson. Yes, thank thank you. I mean, I think we all understand that universal credit has changed um, since it was first introduced, and the UK government, um, I think, um, suggested at first that no one would be worse off under universal credit. But we know there have been a lot of cuts. Um, particularly to work allowances. So I'd like to understand from the panel if you feel that it is still the case that universal credit can and does make work pay, um, and if not, how it can be changed to make sure that that is the case. Kirsten McKeck, do you want to I think for a small number of people, we do have case studies where indeed universal credit has made work pay. Um, we have case studies of people who have maybe no housing costs who are in work who might previously not have been able to access benefits on top of any work that they were doing. Um, I have to say they, those case studies are far outweighed by the number of people who are worse off in universal credit. Um, the kind of things that we are seeing is the application of the work allowance um, means that people earn less before their universal credit is cut. Um, we're also seeing things like the monthly assessment periods causing big problems for people in terms of fluctuating incomes. Um, for example, if you have received two payments uh, in one assessment period, it may be the case that it's seen that you have had both of those and then the next period you get no payment. That could mean you could be subject to the benefit cap, even though you've continued working throughout because of the date of your payment, um, it's seen that you don't have enough earnings to, to escape the benefit cap. Um, but it, and it also means it p makes it really difficult for people to budget according to how much universal credit will they get, depending on their payment date. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rob, sorry. Sorry. Very kind. Uh, Victoria Todd. <laughs> um, I suppose I'd just like to, um, to say, I mean, in the last evidence session, you, you heard from people who were saying, you know, it's probably overall a mixed picture. Some people gain, some people mm -hmm. um, lose. The one thing I'd like to say about the work incentives and something that Littrig's been saying kind of from the beginning is... Um, you can't just look at universal credit in, in isolation. So if you look at it from, from the claimant's perspective um, and, and you know, looking at what they have in terms of cash every week available to them, um, th there's more factors you need to take into account um, than just the taper rate of universal credit. So it's interaction with um, you know, passported benefits. So when you move into work, will you lose the passported benefits? You'll have increased travel costs. So I think when we talk, talk about you know, does universal credit make work pay, um, there's, there's a lot more factors that, that we have have to think about um, than just uh, universal credit, which is a mixed picture anyway uh, of, a set of itself. Rob Jones, I'd certainly echo echo both of those those points, and I think it's say that um, that the changes, particularly to the work allowances, have have sort of impacted how um, um, sort of how much universal credit can make work pay. Um, there's been a number of, of studies in terms of how. Um, I guess kind of relatively generous universal credit is compared to the previous systems. Um, sort of last year, uh, our two CAB um, in um, East Lothian and Musselburgh and Haddington um, did a, um, a study of all the people who came in for advice on a benefits issue and compared what they would be doing if they were claiming universal credit compared to the, the legacy system. Um, for the people who were employed or self-employed, 18% um, saw no change in income. 18% um, income would increase, and that's by a median of um, just over £18 a week, um, and 45% uh, decreased by a median, median of £39 a week. Um, so it can it can vary, um, but it's it's certainly not always the case that 
um, that people would be who are in work would be better off on universal credit compared to the, the previous system. I mean, do you have a view on how universal credit compares to working tax credits when it comes to supporting people on low earnings? I guess that's probably it, there's there's probably sort of um, sort of looking at that is is um, sort of financially um, then um, some will gain some will some will lose um, in terms of the um, the kind of I guess support in terms of um, um, to uh, I guess increase earnings from from the job centre that's not something that would have existed under the the, the tax credits um, the tax credit system. Um, in terms of, I guess, sort of ease of claiming, then um, there's always been issues with um, sort of overpayments of tax credits, and that's because um, it, um, the system requires people to sort of estimate their earnings over, over the year, which is then reconciled at the end, and there, there can be differences if, if, um, if people's circumstances have changed during, during the year. Um, that can sometimes, the case um, with universal credit, if people's earnings fluctuate month to month for the, the, sort of the reasons that, um, that Kirsty McAckney outlined. Um, so there's, there's, I guess it's sort of, um, um, a, a, sort of a, a range of different ways of, of, of kind of looking at, um, looking at support. Um, but um, it's, it's um, there's certainly sort of, I guess there's, there may be sort of um, some pros, um, pros to it, but there's, there's a, potentially a few pitfalls as well. Does anyone else have a view on, on how they compare supporting people with low earnings? I think some of the things that we've noticed are um, the real-time information is should, in principle, make it much easier for universal credit to get information about people's earnings without them having to report, and it avoids things like having to guesstimate what you're going, your earnings are going to be. But in, print, in fact, we have seen times where the real-time information hasn't been accurate. Um, and that has caused huge problems for people's um, universal credit um, and that the two don't match up. And we've had difficulty persuading DWP to accept mm -hmm. the client's information um, that they may have through bank statements and things like our wage slips rather than information that's come direct from HMRC. Um, we've also seen issues in relation to childcare, um, either the childcare element just not being included in universal credit awards accidentally, um, but also the issue of having to report your childcare costs after you have paid them. So people are being expected to pay for their childcare costs before they can be reimbursed for them, which is obviously a barrier for people in low incomes. Whereas with tax credits, you could say, this year I expect to pay X amount on childcare, um, and that would be included in your award. Okay, thank you. Just to add, I mean, in terms of the comparison with working tax credit, um, I think it is hard to directly compare because universal credits, um, obviously including all the six benefits, um, but tax credits obviously had um, these hours thresholds um, that, that um, encourage people to, to, you know, try and get to 16 hours, um, for example, for lone parents and, and other groups, or 24 hours or 30 hours. Um, and, and then beyond that, you know, the incentive wasn't, wasn't as strong. And I think with universal credit, because we don't have those hours thresholds, I think some of the research IFS have done have kind of seen, so there's a shift in terms of, you know, where the incentives lie at different, um, different hours groups. Um, and I think with childcare, obviously, under universal credit, it's more generous um, childcare support than under tax credits, uh, because you get 85% compared to 70 percent so um and again it it ends up as a mixed bag um, of results for depends on the circumstances of the person mm -hmm. okay thank you okay uh, just for the benefit of, of members i think all members hospital members now michelle all you want to speak as well in this okay, at the moment. because i've got every other member wanting to speak so i'll just ask you for a little bit of patience uh, jeremy balfour thank you Kavina, and, and good morning um, I, I just wanted to go back to, I think, the point picked up the community at the start about the sanctioning and, and how that's maybe developed over the last two or three years. I, I, I mean, I visited two job centres within my region in the last two weeks um, and talked to them about sanctions and about how they work. And the evidence that they're giving me is that it has changed maybe in the last couple of years that there's a, if you like, a lighter touch that claimants will be getting a number of letters, a number of phone calls before any sanctions are started. 
I'm just wondering, have you picked up a change in how it has been dealt with locally in regard to that? And is that a positive move and how could it be improved? Rob Gowns, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that sort of um, whilst there are still issues with sanctions, it's nowhere near the, the problems that we had, um, say, back in probably, I would say, 2013, 2014, where it was probably um, the sort of the the sort of the biggest issue and the biggest concern that um, that sort of CABs would have and, and citizens of Scotland would have in terms of the the kind of the frequency of sanctions, um, the I guess the fairness of sanctions and and um, and the whether it's um, also to take individual circumstances into account. So it I think it it certainly seems to be the be the case that um, um, that a lot more of the kind of the client circumstances are taken into account um, now compared to compared to then and um, the kind of the um, we don't sort of receive sort of as many as many reports about sort of problems with um, with I guess a sort of sort of unfair sanctions as we as we used to so they sort of seem to be have been a, a sort of change made over the last few years. Um, I would agree with Rob, certainly in relation to job seekers allowance, um, we have seen a huge reduction in the number of sanctions and as Rob says we don't see the sort of ones that we might have thought have been unfair before. We have noticed an increase in relation to sanctions for universal credit though um, and I think that's partly about there is in a larger number of people within universal credit who are subject to conditionality than there were previously. So, for example, things like if somebody's waiting for a work capability assessment under universal credit, they may still have conditional conditionality attached to them. If you were waiting for a work capability assessment for employment and support allowance, you generally wouldn't be expected to do anything in relation to looking for or preparing for work. And what we are seeing, again, this is where the work coach uh, discretion comes in. Some work coaches aren't applying conditionality pending a work capability assessment, but some are, and including you know, a work search for up to 35 hours a week, and people who have been declared unfit to work by their doctors um, are finding it difficult to comply with those conditions and have um, had sanctions as a result of that. Um, in relation to other issues, in relation to universal credit sanctions, um, we've seen a couple of cases where there was a delay in notifying the failure that somebody had failed to do something. Um, and because of that, they experienced a sanction for a longer period of time. It was the kind of thing that had they been notified at the time, they might have been able to rectify quite quickly. But because there was a delay by DWP notifying them, the sanction applied for about 26 weeks. Can I seek clarification just in regard sure. to your... Uh, around the, um, the sanctions, in that the people who have these conditionalities put on them, if they're not meeting that conditionality, mm. are they given a warning before any sanctions take place? Um, I couldn't be absolutely sure in relation to that. I think um, some of the cases we've had, it's people who've had sort of been quite vulnerable, they've um, experienced mental health problems, found it quite difficult to engage. Um, and who've been repeatedly sanctioned. So whether they've been warned or not, I couldn't be absolutely sure. I, I, mean, I mean, I suppose the question around this is, if someone's not willing to engage with the system for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they may need support on that, but if they're not willing to engage with the DWP, mm -hmm. um, that is different from someone turning up 10 minutes later and suddenly being sanctioned. And I suppose what I'm trying to work out is, are the DWP trying to help in regard to that by sending either texts or letters or phone calls um, before they go into sanctions? I think some of the concerns we've had is that some of the people have been very well, it's become been quite apparent that they're quite vulnerable because of mental health problems um, and that we don't think adequate steps have been taken in relation to them being a vulnerable person. Um, so it may be that there might have been a text sent, but there haven't been enough steps taken to protect that person as a vulnerable person. So what extra steps would you put in to, to, to help a, a coach around that? What, how would you deal with it then? 
I think it's recognising that um, whether the conditionality might be appropriate. If somebody's been repeatedly sanctioned while they're waiting for a work capability assessment, there may be questions to be asked about whether the conditionality for that person is, is, is appropriate. Does this person have the appropriate support put in place to engage with the system? OK. OK. okay can I just check? Um, sure. Because it was mentioned earlier that the, the workload of... Uh, uh, a work coach was 85 clients, and that was anticipated to uh, rise to 373 clients. If they're missing vulnerable people right now with 85 clients, mm -hmm. what's going to happen when they've got 373 individuals mm -hmm. with their own stories to tell and their own vulnerabilities? Is, should we anticipate much more of this kind of thing, Kirsten McKechnie? I think we have to bear in mind, to be fair, in relation to 373, a lot of the people will not have very little communication with their work coach. It may be that they're receiving universal credit, they're already, they've no in-work conditionality attached to them. So it'll be some of the people who will come over from the work task, working tax credit load who already, who already who don't have that much communication with HMRC. But I would agree, I, we are very concerned about work coaches' workload. They are struggling at the moment to um, communicate with the clients that they have just now, as soon as that's ramped up, it will be difficult for them to keep on top of that, and there is more chance of people being missed in that kind of situation. Just tell me, you have to really know your clients, and the more you have, the more difficult that is. Uh, Polly McNeil. Thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, two lines of questioning. The first is in relation to those who are in work and in receipt of working ca tax credits, and the second question is in relation to um, what needs to be fixed about the universal credit system. Um, so, so you'll be aware that those who are currently in work and who are in receipt of working tax credit, um, when they move to universal credit, they will be subject to conditionality, which they previously weren't. Um, so... so it suggests that using the benefit system to encourage people already in work to increase their hours and pay is unprecedented internationally, according to OECD. And the Social Security Advisory Committee have um, said that the, the, this is, the scale of the challenge is enormous. Uh, and, and on the back of that, they welcome the cautious test and learn approach. Um, I just wonder if it really is necessary, in your opinion, to upset what has been a successful system. So the working tax credit system with child tax credit system for those on low income has helped so many families kept children out of poverty. And now, if they switch to universal credit, which they will have to think by the end of December, and there's conditionality attached to that, it just seems to me that we're creating more problems than we're solving here. I wondered what you thought. Any comments on that? Mr Gowans? Um, I think I think you're sort of, um, absolutely right that um, that it's it's not something that um, there's there seems to be a lot of experience of around around the world. Um, I think probably what's um, advocated with um, with sort of in work progression and work conditionality is that um, if there's um, if it emerges that that it works, then um, then great. What I think we would the the concerns that we would have about as you've outlined is is sort of introducing that at the same time as you're introducing what's what's the kind of the biggest reform to the social security system since the social security system was created in um, in rolling out universal credit itself. Um, so I think basically it would it would be something that that we would that we would certainly say to sort of take a. Um, take a sort of a, a sort of a long term and, and slow approach and not um, um, trying to, to rush it because it's 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 effectively it's it's a it's a different skill um, to add to the to, um, um, the work coaches um, the work coaches skill set at a time when their um, their number of clients are, are increasing so I think it's 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 basically it's it's right to take a sort of a, a sort of very cautious approach to um, to in work progression and conditionality. Okay. Any other comments that Kirsten McKay? Yeah, I think the I think any support to help people progress in work can is a positive thing. However, um in the way that this has been done in relation to universal credit is only looking at one lever um in terms of sort of trying to encourage people 
uh, to progress through work, but it's not necessarily looking at the availability of work, um, what type of work that there is for people, what restrictions people might have on their ability to increase their hours. Um, uh, for example, if they're um, lone parents and people with caring responsibilities are restricted by the very nature of their family circumstances and the amount of work that they can do. And so it's vital that we are still able to support people with an adequate income who are not able to increase their hours of work. But it's also not looking at availability of things like childcare locally and transport locally. So it's one of these things that if we want people to increase their hours and progress, we need to have a much more holistic view. It can't just be viewed through the lens of social security. Um, I mean, I just echo what Kirsty said. It needs to, um, you need to have a whole view of all of the, the different um, factors. I w what I would say about tax credits is what I touched on before, is that obviously within the tax credit system, um, the, there were certain incentives at, at different hours points, and that's different under universal credit. I think um, you know, m more work needs to be done to understand how universal credit is working in terms of the work incentives. Um, before we then start, you know, rolling out all of the in-work in conditionality and, um, you know, thinking about that as well, because it is new, as you said. Um, I think that there's been one study um, in in the US where. Um, you know, it kind of did show that um, you can um, help people um, progress with some with some intensive work who are already in work, um, but it is very new, and we've got a very different population. So I think, but doing everything together, um, as Rob said, is a is a huge challenge. Would it, would it not have been easier just to leave that side of things alone? I think it's going to be a big shock to a lot of people who don't actually think they're in the social security system because they're working and they're paying their taxes and they're working hard and they're getting a bit of help from the state because they have children or because they don't earn enough. And it just seems to me that, that to include that group in the universal credit system is going to add, because you've already explained some of the difficulties that do need to be fixed, even if you support the idea of it. But by December, it just seems to me, it needs to be, I, I would like to feel there are much bigger voices saying, oh, hold on a minute, you know, why should these people be subject to conditionality? What is the, I mean, what is the reasoning behind that? I, I've got serious concerns about that group of people. I just wondered if you thought more needs to be done to, to maybe highlight this? I think more, more needs to be done to understand whether in-work conditionality will, will make a difference for that group. And I think you know, that these trials, um, it, it was a very small trial, um, so they need to continue doing mm -hmm. that work to see actually um, whether it does have any um, positive outcomes. And also to understand the challenges, because from the work coaches I've kind of had conversations with, um, that their, their concerns about um, having conversations with tax credit claimants, as you say, so people who are already in work, who are already feel like they're trying really hard it's a very difficult conversation to have yeah can i just but how can it go at, how is it how can you expect it to go at any other way than being a negative experience the people now who've got problems with the working tax credit they come to their mps their msps and we have a hotline and we phone them I and mean, actually we can we can sort it this is all going to change i, I don't see how I, I cannot see the positive aspects of changing the system because conditionality does imply that if you don't meet the conditions, you are going to lose some of your tax credit. Where at the moment, as long as you're, it's your earnings. So th it seems to me there's got to be an, a downward trajectory for that group. I can't see applying conditionality can only go one way, can it not? Um, <laughs> I would say, that, but again, some of the claimants who who have um, kind of met in the job centres, who who have been part of this trial, um, some of them did have positive things to say about it because um, they they welcome the additional support that they they, they wouldn't have got under tax. But I'm not credits. talking about claimants. I'm talking about people who are already in work who will be no, subject. Right, that, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So people who are who are already working who right. would have been claiming tax credits, but because of their area who are now in universal right. credit. Um, some of you know some of them have had some positive experience of having support from the work coaches um, to to um, increase the number of hours or to mm -hmm. look at other options to have training. So so the it, it, the stories that I've heard aren't all negative in that respect. Okay, well that's helpful to know. Um, is there any work being done that you're aware of? Because if you're in work, it seems to me, if you speak to anyone who's in work and they want to get a new job, it's quite hard because you don't obviously want to tell them, your employer that you might be moving on and you're required to do it because you're trying to progress your employment. Has any work been done 
around how you actually progress to more hours, a different job? Because I guess what this, that, this is what the system is supposed to design to do, is to encourage and motivate you to do better, get a better paid job. But it's easier said than done. Would you not agree? Kirsten McKechnie. Yeah, I would, um, it, it, um, you're absolutely right. It is easier said than done. I think if you spoke to some local job centres, they would tell you that they are doing, trying to do work um, in order to support people. And um, we have also heard people who have appreciated the support that they've been getting in work. I, I think, again, it depends on yes, who, which job centre you're with, who your work coach is, um, what your experience of this will be. Some people are simply being told to increase your hours or ask your employer for a pay rise, but whereas other people are genuinely getting support and training that they wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Anyone else, just, anyone else want to come in on that just before we move on? No. Sorry. Um, just lastly, um, there's a lot needing fixed. I, I hope you'd agree with that when the, the, some of the evidence you've given the committee already about the out of sync aspects of it. Um, do you have a list of things you think need to be fixed? Do you have top three, for example, of things that should be fixed? and? I presume from what you're saying, you think it can be fixed. I have deeper concerns on that personally, but um, I would be interested in your evidence on that. Yes. Yeah, we, we do have a list. Um, some of our kind of key things would be to increase the work allowance, um, to remove the two-child limit um, and remove the benefit cap, and also for the period where people have their advances, that they don't have to pay them back because you have the five week wait at the beginning of a universal credit claim. Um, you can get an advance, you're given a year to pay that back, but it is, giving, it is causing people financial hardship over a longer period of time rather than that kind of initial crisis period. That's probably our, our three main asks. Okay. Any other asks, Victoria Todd? As for, for us, the, the area that we've been doing uh, most work around is the self-employed. Um, so we, we would like to see um, some changes around um, how you measure income for the self-employed because currently the monthly assessment periods don't reflect the realities of self-employment. Um, the minimum income floor is likely to um, lead to people coming out of self-employment or indeed not starting um, self-employment. And, and, and I, I'd echo the, the points Kirsty's um, made around you know, increasing the, the work allowances and, and putting the money back in that was uh, taken out of the system. Like the others, we've got a, a sort of a long list of, of issues that um, that we think should be fixed at the universal credit. If it was pick three, it would be um, to um, um, ensure that people who can't, um, who have poor digital skills, are st still able to access universal credit. That might be through the through the phone or in, in person. Um, addressing, as as, as Kirsty McKenzie said, the um, the issue with the um, the five week wake at the start of the claim, and then the um, if somebody is given an advance payment that uh, they don't need to repay that, or at very least that um, that the um, the deductions are, are reduced at a much at a much lower rate at the moment. That can be up to forty percent. And what what we've sort of observed happening is whilst um, we're seeing less problems with um, with the gap in income at the start of the claim because people are taking advance payments um, that that in some ways sort of kicks the can down down the road because they need to repay that over the first few months so they're on a, a sort of very reduced income for quite a period of time um, so those I think would be the the issues um, the one would be around um, around fixing some of the the issues with rent arrears and we're um, we're going to be publishing a, a sort of report in that in the next couple of weeks which I'm sort of happy to send to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shula Robison. Thank you, uh, Kamina. Um, good morning. A couple of questions. One, the first one, picking up on Pauline McNeill's questions about tax credits. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, I think what we're getting back from you is we're not quite sure there's some winners, some gainers, but you're concerned about what happens when everybody else on tax credits migrates over, which is dis by December. Is that, is that right? Thing is due to start um, in January, and right. then it will gradually increase numbers with the bigger numbers coming from October 19. So I think one of the real concerning things that I've 
heard this morning that someone said, I think it might have been yourself, Kirsty McKechnie, was that some people may decide not to even apply for universal credit because their perception at the moment is that they're not actually in the benefit system. They're getting help with their tax credits through that, that system and they don't see themselves as being part of the benefit system. So I think there could well be people on the basis of what they perceive to be the stigma and perhaps even some of the negative stories that they themselves will have heard about universal credit may stop them even applying for universal mm. credit. And as leading welfare organisations, are you putting in place any monitoring or studies to pick up how much that occurs among that population of people on working tax credits at the moment? And also those who do choose to uh, move over to universal credit, what impact on their income there is? Because Pauline McNeill asked, you know, whether you know, her perception as mine would be that there will be more losers than winners, but it would be really helpful to have the evidence of that as we go forward a year down the line, 18 months down the line. And as key organisations who are uh, in the field and are picking up and have perhaps have the capacity to do that because of the people coming through your, the door for help, you know, are you going to be monitoring that so that perhaps in a year's time we can get evidence back about what is actually happening on the ground with that population of people in working tax credit? Rob Gaines? Um, yes, we will be. Um, we, um, we basically have a, a kind of an ongoing monitoring system um, in terms of what people come for advice about, both in terms of the advice that's given, um, but our, um, our CAB advisors will send us um, sort of any cases where they see um, that there's there's some sort of, uh, sort of social policy issue there that um, that um, affected, and that that would be that would be the sort of thing that they would they would send through to us, and it's it's certainly something that um, that we'll kind of be looking out for as well as the sort of the other the other issues caused by the um, caused by the migration, and in particular mm -hmm. in particular if it is um, within people not to not to apply for for universal credit or to or to kind of, um, if somebody was to to kind of miss miss the letter telling them that their their sort of claim would be their claim would be closed and that they would have to apply for universal credit if they're if they're missing out and that's that's kind of some of the some of the things that we've that we've kind of fed back in um, in evidence on the on the managed migration process because I think that's that's sort of one of our um, it's fair to say a sort of a, a kind of major concern of ours about the mm -hmm. about how it's going to be how it's going to be done. Okay. Any other comments? Victoria, I'd just say, so with, with managed migration, so that's the process of, um, of people who are on tax credits or, or other legacy benefits um, being invited to then claim universal credit. Um, those regulations are still being consulted on, mm -hmm. so we don't know exactly how, how that process is, is going to work. Um, what I would say in terms of the, the winners and losers, it's, it's a more complex situation, I think, because obviously there are people who can move now um, under what we say is natural migration because of a, a change of circumstance. Um, and, and when we talk about the winners and losers with the universal credit, I think we, we often refer to that group. But under the managed migration process, there's been a commitment given um, that people shouldn't lose out as a result of that move to universal credit. So there is a, there'll be something um, added to their universal credit called transitional protection. Um, so if, if their universal credit is lower than mm. what they were getting on tax credits, they should, in theory... Um, get a transitional protection element mm -hmm. um, to make that difference up. However, that will then be eroded um, or lost. How long does that transitional protection last for? It lasts until um, something happens um, that would either reduce it. So, for example, if you um, have, a, have another child once you're in the universal credit system, um, the universal credit award won't go up until you've used up the transitional protection. So you won't see an increase when you um, add the child, for example. Um, or if you separate from your partner, that would, um, under the proposals, end transitional protection. So there's, there's things that, that can... End. Isn't that a bit concerning, though, that, you know, that actually some of the decisions that people will make in their lives could be influenced by the worry of losing the transitional protection? That, that to me, particularly in, in terms of that 
relationship issue? I mean, there could be abuse issues, or is that a concern that, that you would have? Yeah, certainly it's something we um, flagged up in the, the literary response to the um, to the consultation. And I think it's just very complicated, the, the, you know, the, the proposals around transition protection when you um, lose it. And if we think, you know, our discussion about work incentives, so, so mm -hmm. understanding what will happen if you take more hours or all of, the, all of those kind of factors makes everything really complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be a challenge to explain it to people and for people to understand how their changes will impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, CPAG in Scotland already has the early warning system monitoring the impact of changes in the benefit system. We take information from our own advice line and also we ask frontline workers with direct experience working with clients to feed in information and from that we've been monitoring the impact of universal credit quite closely mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, and we sort of provide that information that evidence sessions like today. We also work closely with DWP to report back on the sort of administrative side of things. Um, and from that, yeah, we can see already that natural migration means that people are quite a bit worse off. So as uh, we've picked up that there will be the, the, mig the sort of mass migration and people will have transitional protection then. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there's actually a number of people who are losing out already, mm -hmm. um, who are moving over. I think one of the case studies we used was an example of a couple who married, um, who one of the partners had been on tax credits. Unfortunately, her partner um, was terminally ill. She knows that she will be at least £40 a week worse off mm -hmm. under the universal credit claim than she is underneath the tax credits claim. And that's what's happened to her at the moment. And there's a surprising number of people who've gone through the natural migration process. So obviously, there'll be lots more under the mass migration who may get the, um, mm. the transitional protection. But just to reiterate that change of circumstances, we've seen an, the change of circumstances triggering the universal credit claims. I think that is a, definitely a concern in relation to transitional, transitional protection going mm -hmm. forward. Thank you. A question about mon monthly assessment period as well? Is quite yep, good. Yeah, so it, someone mentioned earlier on about the, the concerns of monthly assessment period and the, the budgeting difficulties. And obviously, many of uh, those people will rely on um, services provided potentially by local authorities, the wel welfare fund, discretionary housing payments, and advice services such as your own. Have you any evidence around? the impact on local authorities of mitigating some of this and clearly what might be coming over the horizon in terms of concerns with the mass migration. Is that a concern? Have you done any evaluation of what you think in terms of what local authorities may be setting aside in budgets or what they may or the impact that there may be on their services? Um, have you done any analysis of, of that? Or, yeah. I guess not Not analysis of what um, local authorities are doing on that, that particular issue. Um, on the kind of the issue itself, it's, it's, it's a problem for um, that the kind of exists within the, the sort of the design of universal credit um, for people who aren't paid on a monthly basis. Um, and since if, if somebody is paid for weekly, then at some point in the year, then um, then they would end up with two payments in their in their assessment period, so they, which would often take their income um, too high to, to receive universal credit. Um, and similarly with um, with people who are paid weekly, um, people who are on a, a sort of zero hours or a fluctuating arrangement. Um, in terms of the um, the figures for the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, I'm not sure that they they kind of I guess disaggregate them down to down to that level. Mm. Um, it's certainly something that we've um, that we've seen um, seen clients who who have needed um, sort of make an application to the Scottish Welfare Fund because there's um, um, because there's there's sort of a, a sort of a, a gap in their income or their mm. income's fluctuated as a result of um, as a result of when they've um, when they've been paid or um, and that um, and how that interacts with with sort of universal credit, so there is there is some impact there, but I couldn't give you a, a kind of an exact figure. Okay. That we've looked at. Okay. 
we've not done any formal analysis, but I think the early warning system highlights that the issues with universal credit are clearly a driver to people using Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, and I think you can see the figures from Trussell Trust about mm. the increase in use of food banks when an area has gone to full service, um, suggests that you know, people are experiencing income crisis, and that obviously has an, in a knock-on impact on local authorities and mm -hmm. services. OK. OK, Mark Griffin. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I just wanted to come back to an issue you touched on before, which was um, advance payments and the recovery rates for advance payments. Now, an advance payment is given to someone because they are in an absolute desperate need. They have no choice. They have no income, nothing to support um, the family. Um, I just wanted to ask what your experience has been on the, the impact of those people who have who've had no choice, they have had to take an advance payment, what the impact has then been on them going forward throughout the course of the 12 months that they've had to, to repay that advance? I think, okay, it, I think it's, it's um, sort of one of our particular concerns um, would be, um, as I mentioned earlier, the kind of the rate that, um, that the, um, those advance payments are then deducted back because it can cause um, um, cause hardship to people over over a number of months, whilst whilst those those payments are um, are deducted. Um, one of the um, the particular issues, and um, we've recently done a done a piece of work in it, which I can which I can send the committee, um, is that if somebody has um, sort of other other debts, uh, for instance, historic tax tax credits um, for payments or um, council tax water arrears, then that can be directed from their their universal credit claim, and that can that can mount up and, and cause um, cause problems as well. Um, so it's that that's something that um, you know, that um, that the well, I guess it's sort of two, two issues. One is that um, we think that there should be um, there should be a payment that's non um, that's basically non um, that the, the the client won't need to pay back at the start of a universal credit claim um, to help sort of bridge that bridge that gap, so that they're um, they're not requiring a, an advance payment, um, um, which which basically functions as a loan. Um, the other is that um, the um, the amount that's allowed to be um, that's allowed, amount um, deducted from somebody's universal credit payment to repay debt um, should be um, should be. Should be reduced um, to avoid people people being in hardship because their um, their sort of their, their sort of benefit payment is constantly reduced over a long period of time. Any other comments on on that? I think that what we've noticed in relation to advance payments is that there's been a real switch, and they were weren't routinely offered to people um, initially, and now they are routinely being offered to people, and so people are taking them and it's not necessarily with an adequate explanation of what is that will mean in the long term in terms of having to repay. So people are offered at a time when they've got no money, a large sum of money. It's based on what it's anticipated you might get in relation to universal credit. So we've actually had quite a few people who've had quite a large advance when in actual fact the reward of universal credit has been much less than that, which accentuates the difficulty of paying back that large amount over that long period of time. Um, and it's also caused difficulty in relation to people having large amounts of money, being given this large amount of money um, at a time when they really need it. Um, we've, anecdotally, we've heard of it being an issue in relation to um, coercive financial control, that sometimes um, a partner's been sort of forced to take out the advance and then the partner's disappeared and she's been left to pay it back. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not without its issues. Um, I think it's caused... Um, serious issues in my region. It, it stark the difference between North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire, where South Lanarkshire um, full service rolled out six months ahead of North Lanarkshire, and the the, the issues coming much uh, thicker and faster in South Lanarkshire with uh, people then having to deal with um, the recovery of advanced payments. And it was um, Hamilton Citizens Advice Bureau that showed me some of the uh, case studies they had where. And because of the recovery of an advance after housing um, costs, people had no money um, to live on. Do you think 
it would be an improvement to, to the universal credit system if that um, the DWP were looking at a, a minimum income that people should be receiving before any consideration is taken to recovering um, any advance payments. Kirsten McEachney. Um, I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the idea of having to pay back the advances is just is simply putting people into financial difficulty. So the idea of um, having a minimum income, yep, that would be a good one. We have lots of case studies of people who, by the time they've had the de multiple deductions taken off, really have very little left to live on. So, yeah, I think a, a protective net around that would be good. Victoria Todd, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I mean, it's not an area that we get a lot of feedback on, given the nature of, of our organisation, and we're focused on cert certain areas of universal credit. But just from um, some of the website queries we had, I'd kind of echo what Kirsty said, that people um, don't really seem to fully understand when they accept the advance, what that will mean um, down, down the line, um, because you, you are effectively offering this huge chunk of money at a time when the person is, is in real difficulty. So the temptation to, you know, to take it um, and not really think through what that means, um, I think, has, has definitely come across, um, and it is a worry. Okay, Rob, um, yes, it's definitely a, um, an option that um, that could be looked at. I think um, I sort of echo some of the some of the points that have been made around um, in um, in sort of in some areas, sort of advance payments have been um, have been promoted quite quite heavily in some cases, sort of. 100% um, advance payments have been promoted quite heavily, um, which um, which can cause cause sort of some of the I guess some of the geographical variations that um, that you are seeing and and some some of the problems who um, for people who then have to pay back the sort of the equivalent of a month's universal credit payment over the over the year as well as all the other um, um, the other sort of debts that are coming out as well. So um, so yeah, I think it's, it's something that could be looked at. Thank you. Okay, uh, George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, like Polly McNeil, I'm trying to get my head round this how someone that's in work would actually the, the benefit of to them of universal credit as opposed to the, the system previously. Because we're told that universal credit is about making work worthwhile and making people make it count. But at the end of the day, if you're sanctioning someone for actually the not staying within uh, what the monthly assessment or everything that's going on. If you're sanctioning individuals, families that are on low incomes, they're trying to get by, they're there for a reason, then if you're sanctioning them, how is that beneficial? How is that going to help the work ethos of the people involved in the process? I just can't, like Pauline, I just can't get my head around that. Rob Gowns? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the... Um, um, I think that probably the, the kind of the, the one the one area where sort of universal credit um, is potentially an improvement over the system is people who would work different amounts of hours in different weeks or um, would look to work more because um, because that that sort of I guess smooths the smooths the gap between between things. But I think it's it's sort of, it's it's a, a sort of fair point and it's um, it's something as sort of as I outlined earlier if. If part of the the kind of theory behind applying sanctions to people who um, who are unemployed is that it's to kind of essentially to hold the feet to the fire to try and look for a, look for a job that doesn't necessarily apply when when somebody already has a job and I think a lot of the the kind of reasoning for the sanctions is not not sort of engaging with the with the work search process which which if somebody already already has a job isn't isn't really Going to be helpful for them, so I think that sort of it's it's definitely that um, that sort of at, at very least a sort of a, a sort of cautious light touch approach should be should be taken because sort of going going around sort of sanctioning sanctioning people um, who are in work isn't um, isn't going to be sort of beneficial for a lot of people. It, it might be similar comments, but anything you want to put on the record, uh, Victoria Todd or Kirsten McEachney in relation to this? Just to um, reiterate what. Uh, Rob has said that, yep, in terms of universal credit can be a positive for people who have got fluctuating hours, maybe have low hours. That used to be that there would be a cliff, age, cliff edge at 16 hours that you would no longer be entitled to job seekers allowance or employment and support allowance. Um, 
and so there was kind of a bit of a gap there before you work enough hours to get working tax credit. So that is a group of people who will be supported. But to apply sanctions to anybody um, will not improve either their ability to look for work or to um, increase their hours of work. Um, mm. We've seen from the evidence that we have in relation to sanctions already, it tends to have an impact on mental health, it tends to have an impact on physical health, it can have an impact on housing arrangements, which then sort of have an impact on your stability of life. Sanctioning will not help people improve their work situations. Okay. Uh, I was just wanting to say there was an interesting exchange, I think it was between Victoria and Pauline as well, was the fact that uh, you said claimants and uh, uh, Pauline kind of went, uh, you know, these are people that are working already, but, you know, you were both right. But the whole point was these people, Pauline's right in the fact that they don't see themselves as claimants. They see themselves as people that are working. And this is a major culture shock for them to actually be, and is it not the case that you're, you're kind of putting people into a system that really shouldn't be part of that process because they are not, like as you said earlier on, because they, they're not people that are trying to look for work and everything else, they're already in work. Uh, Kirsty, you were mentioned there, do you want to call that, Kirsty? So, um, I think is it, that's a difficult one to answer because there are some positives to having, to bringing all the benefits together in this way, in the sense that it that reduces the stigma of out of work benefits. Um, that it should be that kind of slight. If it was to work in the way that it was envisaged initially, mm -hmm. then it would be much easier for people to transition in and out of work without having to apply for different benefits every time they had a change in circumstances. But I do think that because of the way that things have evolved, um, and that now we have got things like the application of in work conditionality, then yes, that does separate a group of people out from the system otherwise. I think we, uh, coming back to what I said earlier, it's, it's too early to know. So mm -hmm. this trial was really small with, with people um, you know, having in-work conditionality. Um, we, we don't know whether it will um, work in terms of helping people progress in work. We don't know whether they will see it as a positive experience. And there are all of the things that, that, that these trials should be gathering evidence on. So we have an evidence base to, to then answer so, you know, some of the questions that you've had. Is Should these people be having in-work conditionality applied? And are there any positives? What are the negatives? How should it be designed? Um, I, I just think we don't have enough um, information. Can I just ask one yeah. final question? Yeah. Just on, uh, I asked the last time, the last panel about uh, self-employed because it was something I hadn't really thought of until that point, uh, which is surprising because my father was self-employed most of his work life. But um, I am aware that how fluctuating an income can be. There must be there's many people out there in self-employment who are on that cusp. You know, and it's the difference between them having an income and not having an income coming into their family home. So, you know, uh, again, I'm having difficulty trying to work out how a monthly assessment for people who do not know what's going to happen day to day uh, from a financial point of view. They've got a rough idea, but things happen. Life's no easy. And uh, they end up having difficulties as well. So surely the monthly assessment for self-employed people just is just madness. Simply doesn't work for people um, who are self-employed um, with, with, with fluctuating earnings, which the, lots of self-employed people have. Um, we, we did include an example in, in our submission to the committee um, that kind of highlights the disparity between the employed and self-employed. So where you've got an employed person and a self-employed person who are earning the same amount over the year, um, in this example, the self-employed person gets £2,600 less universal credit. And that is just because of the fluctuations and because in the months where they earn less, the minimum income floor mm -hmm. um, kicks in um, and they are treated as having 35 hours times national minimum wage. And so over the year, they lose all that universal credit. And the surplus earnings rules, um, if you add those on top of um, the minimum income floor, it, it, it makes the person another £500, so it was nearly £3,000 uh, worse off compared to the employed person. It just simply doesn't work um, to have those fixed monthly assessment periods for the self-employed. Um, OK, if Mr Gowns and Kirsten McKechnie are, are, are kind of nodding heads at those kind of comments, we might. There's a few more questions about to squeeze in and time is against us. Uh, you finished? Is that mm -hmm. OK, Mr Adam? Uh, um, Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah, just, just a quick one for, for clarification, really. When you've been talking about... Um, we, we've been looking at in-work conditionality and you've said there are pros and cons and it's too early to, 
to really um, know yet whether it's going to, to work the way it was meant to work. But when we talk about the sanction side, and we've talked about obviously where it, it hits people hard, um, and often that's where there's been no communication between, say, the work coach um, and from visits I've made to Job Centre, and I know Jeremy's made some of these as well, there does seem to be quite a lot of communication goes out, you know, a number of letters, number of calls, and, and when they get no response, I wondered where then you feel that your organisations come into this and, and support organisations, um, because there does seem to be a sort of a, a gap where people fall through, where nobody can get hold of them. Um, and at the moment, the, the, you know, the, the job centres are not equipped to go out searching the streets and knocking the doors for them. Um, and I wonder whether there's something there about what do we do when somebody go, you know, goes off the radar? Um, because quite often these are the people that, that disappear and find themselves sanctioned um, and that we would be really worried about. And then conversely on the other side, can you just give me a feel in your minds, what sort of percentage are we actually talking about? in terms of sanctioning? Because you said earlier on in, in your evidence, I think, Rob, you mentioned it, that actually, obviously, your records are the people that have issues that come to you, so you don't see the vast proportion that don't. But within those that you do see, what sort of proportion are we talking about and what sort of percentages are being sanctioned? Because, again, in, in the visits to the job centres I've made, they're saying it's very low, and I just want to see if, if you concur with that. Rob Gaines. Um on the the point about sort of proportions of um, of sanctions, I um, I'd need to sort of go away and have a look at our, our figures. And there's also there's also official figures that are published. Um, on the official figures, there there seems to be some kind of discrepancies around around sort of how how it's recorded for. Um, for sort of universal credit and sanctions, mm -hmm. which which sort of haven't been fully addressed, but I can I, I'm happy to to sort of write to the the sort of committee with um, with some of that. In terms of communications with um, with people, I mean it's it's um, it's something that that the, the CAB um, the CAB will will see. Um, we're sort of um, a sort of an, an independent and confidential service, and that that's that's sort of very, very important to us, mostly because of the the reasons that sometimes people won't feel comfortable engaging with the job centre or won't um, won't want to say something to a work coach because they're they're concerned it they might be sanctioned or it might affect the benefits that they might say um, to a, a CAB advisor. So in in some of those cases, then um, then we can help resolve. Um, resolve that issue. So, so, so um, there's sort of definitely a, a sort of an important role for for sort of CABs in in terms of helping um, helping people access the benefits system, but also also in terms of um, making sure they're not sanctioned. And if they are sanctioned, where where they can go to get get help. Okay. Um, no. Any other comments on that before we move to another line? Can of I questions? just yeah. one, one yeah. quick follow up on um, one, one of the issues that has been raised when, I, when I've been at the job centres is a significant concern by the job centres that people are not coming early enough because a lot of the commentary in the press and, and at committees like this suggests to them that going, you know, is either a waste of time or that it would be a negative experience. Um, and I spoke to one or two people who'd gone into the job centre late and they they commented back to me that actually it hadn't been as bad as they'd expected and had been actually quite helpful and they wished they'd gone a bit earlier. Um, so there is some concern that people are not going as early as they should, which then creates problems in terms of their debt accumulation and the issues we were talking around earlier in terms of where they have to wait. They, they've already got to a stage where their finances are, are, are really bad and that just compounds the problem. And I wondered if you'd come across any of that um, well, anyone experience that, impact. that that situation? Uh, not to say anyone really gra gra grasping that because that has been raised by Michelle Ballantyne. It's maybe worth, uh, I suppose, ask, asking the question another way. I, aside, I represent Mary Hill and Springburn. The Mary Hill Job Centre was closed. Perhaps the job centre was the things I found out. I have to say, 
slightly to my surprise, was some of the real positive relationships that was built up between the, the work coach and very vulnerable constituents of mine, uh, quite often lone, lone parents. Uh, a lot of time and hard work uh, and trust going into that. And when the job centre was closed, uh, quite often they were sent quite far away to another job centre with a different work coach and we're back to square one again and that relationship was pretty much destroyed. So have you seen some negative aspects in relation to, to that? Uh, Kirsty McKechnie. The first thing to say about universal credit is that the first contact that you would normally have would, wouldn't be through the job centre, it would be through the online claim process. And that in itself presents a huge barrier to people. Um, to access the online claim, you have to have the ability to use a di you know, digital, um, you need to have access to Wi-Fi. Um, and it's not just a case of you can go on and do a wee bit and then save your application. You have to go through the whole thing in a one or anything you put in is lost if you step away from the computer. So that's the kind of first thing. But in relation to people's experiences of the job centre when they actually get there, yeah, I would say on a whole, it, there's a very changed culture and people's experiences are much more positive. And it's one of the things that we reiterate to people when we're training is that um, the people have got really positive relationships with their local job centre managers. And if you want to get a problem with universal credit resolved, that's a good starting place. Um, but as you've mentioned, the, a lot of the local job centres have been closed and that we have lost some of that local relationship there. OK, I just, I thought that was important just to ba ba balance out that. We're, we're, we're almost going to close the evidence session, but I thought Shona Robson raised some really interesting questions that that made it follow up about uh, sanctioning and work conditionality um, uh, for, for, for those already within the tax credit system when they're migrated over. And that there are some protections in there, but if the family were to have another child, those protections would be eroded. If you decided to leave your partner for whatever reason, I think Shula Robinson quite um, sensitively highlighted a number of reasons why you need to leave your partner, but those protections uh, are, are, are withdrawn, uh, and, and that, that would concern myself as well. But I think the, th the third thing we should raise before we close this evidence session is the idea that under the new universal credit system, all the money goes to one individual in a household, and no one, none of us knows what dynamic there is in that, that household. So the fact that one individual in, in a family home gets all the cash, effectively, from universal credit, does that put some vulnerable people at risk and should we be looking at split payments? Yeah, I want to come in on that. Kirsty McEachan, I'll take you again. Yeah. Just to really come back to um, Shona Robson's point about um, people making choices according to their benefit situation, it's something that we're seeing already. Um, particularly in relation to domestic abuse situations, that the safety net just simply isn't there for people who want to leave an abusive relationship. Um, and in some situations, we have seen people return to an abusive partner. And it, this is not just about universal credit, that's about things like the benefit cap as well, things like the two-child limit. Um, that, so that's definitely an issue that we are very aware of already. Um, and in relation to your um, second point about split payments, yes, split payment. The, it is an issue that universal credit goes to one member of the household, without a doubt. Um, in terms of how you then split that payment, that is turning out to be a really complicated issue. And I do have some sympathy in the Scottish Government in trying to sort that one out, because once you start to look at it, a 50-50 split doesn't necessarily help a household with complicated, complex needs. You might have somebody in the household with a disability. You might have somebody in the household who's paying the childcare costs. What do you do about the housing element? So, yes, the fundamental problem is there. This, the single payment is an issue. How you then resolve it is very complicated um, and not as easy as it sounds. Uh, Victoria Todd, do you want to add? Rob Gowns? No, nothing to add to what Kirsty said, I think. All right, thanks, Victoria. Rob Gowns? Um, yes, split payments um, should absolutely be something um, that, um, that should be looked at. And I know that the Scottish Government is looking at it and it's um, and that's, um, to following the... Um, Changes made to the, the Social Security, um, the Social Security Act this year that um, that that's um, placing requirements um, to do that. Um, 
it, I'd, I'd, I'd echo the point that it's um, that it's it's kind of very complicated in practice to look at. We've um, um, recently sort of done a bit of a bit of work with the the Scottish Government where we've um, um, done focus groups with CAB clients on how it might work out and, and what um, what their their attitudes would be um, would be to it. And it's 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 basically something that um, that, that sort of would um, that some people would. Um, would prefer it might be something that would would address some of the some of the issues with um, with domestic and financial abuse, um, but it's it's very complicated to work out how you might do it in practice. Thank you, Shona. I'd, I'd followed your line of question. Do you want to come back in before we close the session? I think it would be really helpful if you could provide us with some further case studies around those cases of particularly domestic abuse where. You know, decisions are being driven because of the changes that are being made to um, their um, benefits, and also just I think the, the the concern about whether transitional protection issues are going to just exacerbate that. So I think any case studies in the here and now would be extremely helpful. Again. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would be great. And we are time, time is now again. So to bring us, I suppose, back to where we initially started, is an inquiry into universal credit and in work poverty. So I, I think all these issues are, are very, very pertinent because you have as much money going to a household as you like. But if that money is not going to those in need in the household, then there's 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 poverty in that household, irrespective of the money going in. So I think it's really important uh, that that we look at this. But uh, this is an ongoing inquiry. If there was something you didn't get the opportunity to say today, please do write to us. If something else comes into your mind, please get back to ourselves in the committee clerk and just keep us updated. But a really worthwhile evidence session this morning. So can I thank all three of our witnesses for your attendance this morning? But before I move from agenda. Item five. I should have said when we were on agenda item one, of course, that uh, we'd seek to take item seven in private. The, I'm, I'm sure all my, my fellow committee members realised that I hadn't said that, but I'm now asking for permission to item seven in private before Agreed. before we move on. Agreed? Yeah. OK. So thank you once again. That's just the housekeeping that we for us. Move to agenda item six, which has previously been agreed to take in private, when I move into private session. Thank you.